Women's Caucus for Art, for really, they were the impetus behind this. Today, we are privileged to be in the presence of a remarkable artist, an artist who is living her creativity amidst a very busy life here in central Massachusetts during our time. Hi, everyone. I am Joanne Stoll. I'm very excited to be here today and to be able to share my work with all of you. I'm a professional artist and art instructor, and I'm also currently the president of the Massachusetts Women's Caucus for the Arts. So I am primarily a painter, an oil painter, but I've done a little bit of everything over the past several years. And my artwork consists mainly of contemporary realistic oil paintings inspired by my daily life, as well as an unfiltered view of reality. I document my own personal history through my paintings, which is why I'm here talking to you today. I don't consider my work to be directly historical, as my paintings, as I create them, are not images of times past, but I capture my history as it's happening right now, similar to a time capsule. We are all creating history right now. You can see my history as you look back through my work, and you can see how my life has changed over the years, as well as how my work has evolved with those changes. I just want to get a little bit into my background before we dive deeper into my work as my background as an artist and as a human are what influence my paintings. I'm a lifelong artist, so it's difficult to say when my artistic practice actually began. I found my artistic voice during grad school, which is typically what I consider my start date, but I've been painting and creating in many ways my entire life. It's always called to me. Neither of my parents were even remotely artistic, but they were crazy enough to give a toddler a paintbrush and it has stuck with me ever since. <laughs> I currently live and work in Ashburnham, but much of my family is actually from right here in Fitchburg. My great-grandparents actually moved here from Italy and started the De Bonus flower shop that's still across the street. As a child, I loved hearing about my history and where I came from. I just loved the stories. The love of storytelling has stuck with me, just as my love of art. However, the stories that I tell now are visual. One of the first painters that ever caught my attention when I was very young was actually Norman Rockwell with his illustrations that could say so much in a single image. I can't say that my paintings now are directly inspired by his, but that ability to tell a story through a painting has always influenced my work. Through my paintings, I tell stories of my life. I record my personal history as it's happening. It's my everyday life that's my inspiration. I'm a mother of two. I have two daughters, who you can see here in this image. They were younger then, they're teenagers now. Um, but this is them posing a few years ago with a painting that was both inspired by them and that they helped create. I'll talk more about this specific painting later on, but they have overwhelmingly been the inspiration of my work since they were born. I know it sounds cheesy to say that my kids are my inspiration, but becoming a parent forces you to see the world differently. I realized that I knew very little compared to what I thought I knew, and my work changes as they grow older. As you'll see, my paintings were much more chaotic when they were younger than they are now. And a bit of the small town life also creeps into my work. I'm sure many of you know Ashburnham is a very small town, and we have a bit of land and several animals, which also make their way into some of my paintings. My life is certainly not the most exciting, not to say that it isn't at all. After all, anyone with teenagers knows that they keep you on your toes, but it's real. I don't try to glamor any, glamorize anything, not through my work or in life. If you come to visit, you'll find dishes in the sink, dog hair on the couch, and unfinished projects of all kinds scattered throughout the house. It seems like we're always busy, always going from one thing to the next. I'm not really interested in looking like I have the perfect life on social media, and my artwork is not about trying to make any sort of big statement or anything like that. It's simple, not easy, but simple, and it's real. It's mine. It's messy and chaotic at times, but it works. My work is about truth and reality. It's my reality, but I show it with the hope that what I'm showing is relatable to a much larger audience. My artwork depicts my day to day, my life as a mother and a human being, and every painting tells a story. Some of my images may appear dark to some, especially at certain points of my life and work, but I like to remind people that sometimes reality is not pretty. And most importantly, with my art, as with life, a sense of humor is often required. <laughs> now I'd like to get into some of my work. I tend to work in a series at a time. 
Here you can see my main three bodies of work from the past decade, roughly. Each series is slightly different in terms of overall style and materials. It also each has its own main idea. I will get into each individually, but they're each unifying, unified by my overlying theme of reality and my use of black outlining. They are also all primarily oil paintings. With all of my work, I paint in a style that I consider to be contemporary simplified realism, which seems appropriate for my topic. I also use the black line outlining throughout my paintings as I've always been drawn to the boldness of the black paint and I feel like the outlining pulls my work closer to illustration and the idea of storytelling. The black outlining also helps unify each piece regardless of the series. Now I've been asked many times, why painting? Why not show the same idea through photography or some other media? The answer for me is simple. The painting process takes time, especially working with oils. Life can get so busy and painting forces me to slow down, to connect with myself, to not rush. And I love the process of trying to find the image that I see in my head. It's not always entirely there at first, and sometimes I'm not even sure how to get there. But I keep adding paint and changing things, layering, glazing, painting over. Sometimes it can get frustrating when it doesn't seem like it's happening, but I keep going. And then suddenly there it is. Everything just clicks and the painting is complete. It's like a puzzle and each painting challenges my creative problem solving abilities. I also highly prefer realism over abstraction, and I know many incredibly talented abstract painters and I admire their work. However, I've tried abstract painting and it just doesn't hook me like realism does. Something about drawing and painting what you see has always attracted me. Plus, considering my work focuses on reality, realism seems appropriate. Now, looking at these series from the first to the last, the most, rec the most recent, sorry, um, you can see changes in my life and family. My most recent series, Beautiful Mundanity here, is the one that's currently on view in the window. My work is a reflection of my life at the time, with the middle series being a bit different from the other two. I'll explain that series shortly, as it is slightly the oddball in the trio. So here we go. My first series, The Real Motherhood Experience. This was mainly a large, a large series of chaotic works with rough, rough brush rough brush strokes and grittiness. Simple chaos, everyday chaos, the kind anyone with kids can relate to. These pieces were chaotic in terms of materials as well, also a reflection of my life at the time. This series began while I was working on my MFA in Visual Arts at Lesley University College of Art and Design. It's the first work that I created that I would consider to have my voice. This step would simply not have happened if it weren't for some simple yet incredibly impactful advice. The first bit of advice, something I've heard many times before, and I'm sure many of you have heard as well, was simply to paint what you know. So simple and so obvious, and yet it took years for this to finally make sense to me. For so long, I believed that art had to be something big, to make some kind of big statement to, creep, to be meaningful. But trying to create art that I knew so little about was so ingenuine. The second piece of advice was just to step back. And this can mean many things. Very often, it's simply the act of physically taking a step back to look at the work you're creating, to get a different view. However, for me, this stepping back was more of a stepping back in the scene, looking what was going on in the background of the object that I was painting, realizing that there could be more to the story. With, two, with these two simple pieces of advice, my work completely changed, and without them, I would not be where I am today. My grad school thesis was fully titled the Real Motherhood Experience, debunking the idealization of motherhood through art. And the series is a result of the work, plus a few years after. During the time that I was working on the series, my kids were younger, I was a full-time student, and I was balancing a regular day job at the same time. Things were chaotic. My work was also chaotic in many ways, both intentionally and as a result of my life. This series grew from a fascination with the near constant idealization of motherhood, both in our society and in art. I felt like I was constantly seeing these perfected views of motherhood that led to unrealistic expectations. I realized that there's a common misconception in motherhood, that it should be wonderful all the time, and if it's not, the mother must be doing something wrong. While this misconception is far from true, there is still so much pressure and judgment placed on mothers today, especially young mothers. Pressure from other mothers, parents, and non-parents. It creates unreachable standards and a great deal of stress when we constantly fail to live up to the expectations. As a mother of two, I quickly realized that this perfection was rare to non-existent. 
I was tired of being told that motherhood was supposed to be the most wonderful, beautiful experience of my life that I was supposed to enjoy playing on the floor with my children for hours, dressing them in perfectly matching outfits and constantly posting pictures of them on social media with the hashtag, I love being a mom. <laughs> of course, if this is for you, all the more power to you. But that was not my experience. And I've come to find that that wasn't what most of mothers experienced as well. I was tired. My house was constantly messy. Regardless of how much a mother loves her children, there's no denying that being a mother is both stressful and exhausting. So I decided to capture the reality of my experience through this series. I chose to embrace the chaos. I created a series of work that was not meant to be pretty, because again, reality is not always pretty. I captured the daily realities of motherhood completely unidealized. I painted scenes of daily life as a mother shown in ways that I hope others can relate to as well. Most of my work in the series was large scale, as I found that the larger I worked, the more of myself and my emotions I could fit into the series. Um, the larger works allowed my entire body to become part of the painting process at times and to be able to actually alleviate some of the stress of being a parent through the paint. My use of bold black outlining combined with scraped gritty surfaces and dramatic colors were both in response to the highly idealized images of motherhood and were also my way of better expressing the true chaos of my experience. My style is also partially influenced by German expressionism with the dark color palette and the brush strokes full of emotion. I focused on the scene, the whole story, in many of my paintings, I made the decision to eliminate the actual figure of the child and instead put the, influence, the emphasis on the traces they leave behind. The actual physical traces even become part of some of these paintings. I found that sometimes the work could be more about them when they're not there. It therefore became more about the mess and the residue that follows everywhere they go. My work was like a crime scene where the viewer must dis discern what happened based on what's left behind. <laughs> And now to talk about some specific images. This piece is titled, Don't Even Breathe. It's an oil painting on wood and it's two feet by three feet. I work on wood for much of my work as I prefer the sturdy surface of, for scraping over the bounce of a canvas. Anyway, this painting captures a time when my daughter had finally fallen asleep on the couch after a very rough day. She looked so little curled up in the corner of the couch. The house suddenly felt eerily quiet, and I was worried that even the slightest noise would wake her and we would have to start all over again. Even the blanket on the arm of the couch, painted almost as though it was snake-like, was a threat. The simple act of covering her up could have been a disaster. What's that? that <laughs> yep. Okay, here we have one of my darker looking pieces. But for this piece, you definitely need a sense of humor to truly appreciate it. It's titled, If You Don't Like How My Room Looks, Don't Look At It, after what my precious then six-year-old daughter said to me when I stood in her doorway and com commented on the state of her bedroom. This is also oil on wood panel, and it's two feet by four feet. This piece from 2014 was a collaborative, and I say that word loosely, painting between me and my then four-year-old. She started the painting with acrylic. You can see her hearts in sunshine and smiling faces through the paint. I then went over it with oil with a boring painting of our hallway to contrast the serious adult world with the optimistic world of the child, to which she responded that I ruined her painting. <laughs> Thus the title of this piece. She's not wrong. This piece is two feet by two feet and also on wood. This next one has a comical backstory. And I'm sorry about the quality of the image, it's not the best. But I can say it's comical now. It wasn't funny at the time. This piece is titled, Put It Away When You're Done, which is what I told my kids for when they were done playing with their sled after a snowstorm. Long story, sto long story short, they didn't put it away. This is an image of our snowblower having completely destroyed the sled, a very real event. In the top left corner, you can see a trail of snow clothes on the floor where they were left playing after playing out, where they were left after playing outside, the sled forgotten. Down on the bottom, that separate red chunk below the sled, that's actually a piece of plastic from the sled itself. I attached it onto the painting. In this painting, you can clearly see how I use different tools to scrape the surface and put some of the emotion I was feeling at the time into the painting itself.
my largest at seven and a half feet by four feet. The aftermath is a, is a painting on three separate wood panels, one of which comes, to the comes out on an angle on the floor. You can kind of see it in the image. In this piece, I took the idea of including the physical objects left behind, like the plastic from the sled, a step further. The bottom panel is painted to look like our wood floors, but the items on the floor are the actual physical items that my kids have left lying around. Dolls, drawing supplies, crumpled paper, a half-eaten lollipop. For the panel on the left, you can see it in the larger picture. That's the wall. I painted our wall in the trim um, to look like our wall, and then I gave the kids some Sharpie markers to finish the job. This was similar to the time when they found a Sharpie while I was in the shower, and they decorated our entire newly painted hallway. At least this time they had permission. <laughs> Then the third panel on the right, the largest panel, shows the scene in my living room as a whole with all the chaos painted in my style with the black outlining throughout. And now here I take that incorporation of found objects still further. This time I, found, I started by attaching the found objects, again, things that my kids had left behind, to the panel and then I primed and painted over on top of the objects. My goal for this piece was to show the impossibility of creating a neat space while the kids are playing. Adding to the implied impossibility was the actual challenge of creating the painting itself on a very uneven surface. This piece is smaller than the previous at only 24 inches by 20 inches and the title is An Impossible Task. So looking back, this series does not appear as uniform, so to speak, as my recent work. But the reason why is clear. My life was a bit chaotic at the time. Focus is limited when your kids are young and they change so quickly at that age. They can seem like two totally different people from one day to the next. My work, the materials, the way I incorporated certain physical items or didn't, even the mark making was all a reflection of my life at the time. Even the process for creating changed from piece to piece. Some would start with sketches, some would happen directly on the final surface. I would almost always use reference photos as I still do, but how many and for what purpose would change depending on the painting. Sometimes you just need to take what time you have and what materials you have available and just go for it. No additional time for planning because you don't know when that window of focus will be available again. That was simply life in that season. Now I would like to introduce you to my Battle Scars series. I'm very excited about this series and I hope you will be able to see why. Battle Scars is a series of paintings depicting the female postpartum body. The paintings show up close views of stretch marks and C-section scars of 12 women who will remain anonymous. I created them so that they would appear to be abstract to the unaware viewer, to draw the viewer in, to get them to look. As with my last series, I chose to paint that which we don't talk about. This series grew out of my own insecurities. I can relate to the countless number of mothers feeling insecure about their bodies after childbirth. I remember, even while pregnant, just how many well-meaning people would ask me about my stretch marks. Mainly, how I was planning to get rid of them and get my body back after. As though bringing a new life into the world wasn't good enough, I also needed to look good while doing it. <laughs> I spent years after my, child, my children were born feeling like my body was now something to hide and feel ashamed of. Like I said, my children are now teenagers, but those marks never went away. They are a permanent part of my body. They are my history and they tell the story of how my children came into the world. It took years after my kids were born to finally realize that those marks were a sign of strength, not of weakness. Like a soldier's scars from battle, my stretch marks are my battle scars. I then forced myself out of my comfort zone and created my first battle scars painting, shown here. It's smaller than the other 12 paintings in the series. This one is only two feet by two feet and it's based on my own body. I immediately realized that this painting couldn't stand alone. I reached out to other mothers that I knew, told them my story and what I was creating, and showed them my first painting. I was surprised and so grateful for just how many mothers were willing to open up and share their story with me. I received photos from 12 mothers, all at different stages in their motherhood journey. I asked for their stories. I asked if there were any colors that they felt best represented their personal experience. Every story was different. Every mark and every scar was different. I did my best to capture each individual story of strength and life. And just like that, the Battle Scars series was born. Here you can see each of the images side by side and how each one is completely, de next, 
is completely different to the ones next to it. The scar patterns are created from the photos I, that were provided from the 12 models, and the colors and titles are all representative of their unique experiences. I wanted each of these pieces to show the strength of the individual mother, and I wanted the women to feel empowered for what their bodies have done, not insecure. Further, I wanted the viewer to see the paintings as something beautiful, both before and after realizing what they are. Each of these paintings represents a deeply personal experience for a specific mother. Every line and every stretch mark tells a story. I created this series to bring to light something that should be celebrated and viewed as a sign of strength, not something that needs to be fixed. These paintings, therefore, show another reality of motherhood, but in a way much different than my last series. The process for creating each of these paintings was similar. They all started with a photo from the model. From there, I would clarify the image as much as possible on the computer without losing the distinct, unique scar patterns. I wanted the marks to be as close to exact as possible so that they could actually capture, accurately capture each individual. I would then create a unique color palette before moving onto the canvas. Each painting was created on a three foot by three foot canvas. First, I'd coat the canvas with a flat coat of acrylic, the color dependent on the color paddle for, palette for the specific model. Then the marks would be transferred in black on top. The rest of the painting came from layers of glazing color on top of the marks until, until finished. Glazing is when thin coats of transparent paint go on top. This first piece is, is titled Night and Day. This was a mother who had two pregnancies with two very different experiences. She said they were, her words, like night and day, thus the title. She told me that her first pregnancy was a carefree experience. However, her second was full of worry and anxiety due to several losses before being able to get pregnant again. Here that is represented as night and day. Now we have triple strength. Again, we have a mother who had a very difficult time trying to become pregnant. After a long time of trying, she found herself pregnant, not with one child, but with three. She is one of the strongest women I know. Life through fire comes from the story this mother told me about how her stretch marks spread like wildfire. One minute they weren't there, and the next they covered much of her body, and they burned, she told me. So now I'm moving on to my most recent series, Beautiful Mundanity. Although this body of work is not yet completed, I'm very excited about where it's going. This series is similar to the real motherhood experience, but with smaller works more refined, clearer brushstrokes, and a much calmer feel overall. Here again, my work continues to focus on reality and telling stories. Life is different now than when my kids were younger. I wouldn't call it calm by any means. I now spend every evening driving them from one activity to another, but at least now I can disappear into my studio for a bit without worrying about whether the house will still be standing when I return. That change has resulted in a change in how I work, as well as a change in the work itself, and I'm very pleased with the results. My process has slowed down a bit, and the mood created in the images is somewhat slower than the chaotic images of the real motherhood experience. I continue to attempt to capture the struggles of being a mother and a human being, as well as the quiet moments that often go unappreciated. This series specifically focuses on simple realities, the day-to-day, -day, the mundane, Recently, I have found that it's becoming increasingly challenging to know what's real. We live in a time of extreme excess, extreme busyness. Social media takes over everything. Everything is just too much, too much input, too busy, too fast. We can have whatever we want, whenever we want, but what do we want? This is a question I found myself asking while trying to constantly filter what's real from what's just noise. This series of paintings has grown out of that soul searching. These works are an attempt to remind myself to focus on what matters, of what is real when it seems like the world is spinning too fast. What is real may not always be what is the most exciting, but it's true and it's what grounds us. Through my work, I am trying to intentionally stop and appreciate the simple things that often get ignored in our hectic lives. As you can see, my, child, my style has changed somewhat over the years, but the black outlining remains. I continue to use oils, as I just love the fluidity of the oil paint, and I also continue to paint primarily on wood panel, again, because I love the firm surface. I feel that the smoother surface is better for the illustrative qualities in these pieces that I desire. I break an art rule by adding pure white and pure black to each of these pieces. I was always taught never to add black because it deadens a painting, but I disagree. And I just can't get enough of that lamp black. 
I really feel that it adds to the contrast, which is very important to these recent works. The high contrast really brings the viewer in and helps keep them there. And life would be pretty boring without contrast. This painting here, which you can also see in the front window, is titled Lived In, and it's one of my favorites. And this piece, I wanted to capture a typical day in the winter in my home. This is my living room. This painting was also created during the height of COVID, so everyone was at home and using the house as a school and office, so neatness really wasn't a concern at the time. Not that it ever really is in my home. <laughs> my dog is lazily laying on the sun on the floor. The couch cushions are permanently squished from kids and animals laying on them, and blankets and other everyday items are strewn all over the couch and the table. But it's my home. It's comfortable, and that's what I wanted to capture. This next piece is titled Rust and Eggs, and it shows some of my chickens roaming my backyard, a rusty wheelbarrow laying on its side, and a tarped over wood pile in the background. This is a typical scene that you would find in my backyard during the warmer months. And if there's anything we have plenty of, it's both rust and eggs. This piece was actually the first in the series, so I'm going a bit out of chronological order right now. I don't typically include people in my paintings, but my daughter specifically asked me to paint this picture of her. This was a typical day in my studio. It was summertime. I was working on a painting, I believe one of the Battle Scars pieces, and my daughter sat behind me and watched. She does this often. She talks to me while I work. Sometimes she'll work on her own paintings while she's up there, but on this day she was just watching. Then she asked me to paint her, and I figured, what's more real than what's going on right at this moment? So I turned around and created a sketch first, then I took a bunch of reference photos because we all know kids don't sit still. <laughs> Although she did do her best. Then it became a painting and this new series began. This piece is coming and going and it's the last that I'll be showing in this series today. It's meant to be a summary of our busy lives. At the time in this image we were in the middle of a kitchen renovation. The walls were white, the windows were open and no blinds were in place yet which created that incredible lighting on the floor. But even though the kitchen wasn't finished, we had things to do and places to go, so life had to go on. Hooks for backpacks and our large family calendar went up on the unpainted wall. Life just doesn't slow down. We are always coming and going. And lastly, before I conclude talking about images, I just wanted to share with you some of my smaller works. These are in-between pieces. They're not part of a series on their own. I find that sometimes it helps to create smaller, looser pieces in between the larger pieces, especially if I'm experiencing any sort of block. I enjoy these little paintings. They're typically only about five or six inches, and they're all on mini canvases, but I do feel like they can stand on their own. I consider them to be small, intimate glimpses into my life, but no less meaningful than my larger works. They capture individual moments instead of an entire scene. Another difference, as you can see, between these pieces and my larger pieces is the lack of black outlining that clearly identifies my work. The reason for this being that these smaller pieces are created almost entirely with a palette knife instead of a brush. There's less control with a palette knife, and the knife creates much more texture. The painterly quality of the paint from the palette knife adds to the fleeting feel that, I, that is my goal for these smaller works but the combination of the high texture and the outlining was just too much for these little pieces, so I made the decision to keep them different from the rest, but still similar in content. Sometimes it's good to change things up. We are creating history right now, no matter how large or small our actions. I'm sure most of you have seen those movies where someone goes back in time and changes just the slightest detail and the entire future or present changes. That's true with life. We don't need to be moving mountains or making some huge political statement to be making history. Simple matters. These little moments matter. I think about that as I create my work. I focus on the real, the simple, the untold truth, the everyday, the mundane, the things that people don't want to talk about, the things that we try to hide away under the carpet. When you paint your life, inspiration is everywhere. It's all important and it all goes into my work. Mostly, I just hope that when people look at my work, it's relatable. I want people to feel a connection. I want someone to be able to see one of my paintings and feel like that's real, that's life today. It can be simple or chaotic and messy and that's okay. Mm -hmm.